Washington, D.C. Fast-paced, smart talk. What's trending and breaking news as it happens. It's Benson and Harf with Guy Benson and Marie Harf. What does that feel like to be kind of the man without a country? That's what it feels like. <laughs> it, it does. I, no, I, I, I could never warm to the president. Uh, long before he ran, he talked about President Obama not being a citizen. I thought that itself is disqualified. Uh, you cannot do that. And then talked about John McCain in a derogatory way, and then talked about uh, Mexicans in a derogatory way. And that, I just think that we've got to do better than that. We, uh, we can't refer to our opponents, political opponents on the other side of the aisle as losers and clowns. We have too big of issues to solve in this country than to just be partisan all the time. It is Monday, October 1st. Welcome to this new month. I'm Marie Harf in Washington, D.C. My friend and co-host Guy Benson's in New York City tonight. We are Benson and Harf. And that voice you just heard was the man of the hour, Senator Jeff Flake, a Republican senator from Arizona who's retiring at the end of this Congress, talking about his larger concerns about the partisanship, about President Trump, sort of setting the stage behind what was a very big decision he made on Friday to call for an FBI investigation into Brett Kavanaugh. A lot to unpack there, but I think that gives us a window into how Jeff Flake is approaching his last few months in office. On the line with us now to ask him about this and many other things is Andy McCarthy, Andrew McCarthy, best-selling author, contributing editor at National Review, former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, a Fox News contributor. He's on Twitter at Andrew C. McCarthy. Thank you for joining the show again tonight. It's my pleasure. How are you? Uh, we're, we're doing well. We're getting through this Monday together. I, I want to start, Andy, with, with Jeff Flake um, and take a step back from the ins and outs of the Kavanaugh process, although I think we'll get to those. But how do you evaluate Jeff Flake? It's his last few months in office. He clearly feels uncomfortable with the level of partisanship on both sides. And he's a key vote, not just on this, but on some other issues. Give us your thoughts on on Senator Flake. Well, I sympathize with anyone who says that, uh, you know, President Trump's manner is uh, off-putting to, especially to people that um, that that kind of do what we do and and inhabit this world. On the other hand, um, I've had to sort of deal with it. You know, I mean, um, <laughs> he's he's the president, and he's going to be the president. And if I don't like him on Twitter, it doesn't make any difference because you know, 63 million people decided to elect him, and he's going to be the president for at least four years. And I think sometimes um, a, a lot of his opposition is a little bit prissy about uh, – is, is so off-put, I guess, by his uh, manner that they're not willing to come to grips with the fact that uh, he's the president, he's going to be the president, and we have to deal. And, you know, I think Senator Flake falls clearly into that category um he's gotten to a point where i think he doesn't have an effective working relationship with the president and the administration at least at times and i think everybody's got to kind of you know sort of suck it up and have an effective working relationship to the extent they can i was in a lot of criminal cases with a lot of lawyers who i didn't like and didn't like me but if we didn't deal with each other you couldn't get a case across the finish line. So you actually have to, no matter how much you you don't want to, you have to kind of suck it up and deal with it. Andy, you have a piece out today at nationalreview.com about a new argument that we've heard from the left in recent days after the testimony from Judge Kavanaugh. And sort of, I tweeted about this over the weekend where they begin by opposing him within minutes of the announcement that he's the nominee. Then they sit on these allegations for two months and drop them at an opportune time after his hearings. Then they call him a liar. They call him, they validate a gang rape allegation against him. The next day he is furious and is visibly furious in response. And they take that fury and say, well, now he doesn't have the temperament. 
uh, to do right. this job. I think it's a very, very cynical line of argument. But I'm going to ask you this. I went back and I watched it again over the weekend because this is something that's weighing on my mind. I, in retrospect, agreed and understood why he did what he did the way he did it. It resonated with me and I related to it. Going back, I wish he wouldn't have been quite as partisan in a few of the statements that he made, clearly in anger, about the Democrats, about this being vengeance for an election that they didn't want to lose, the Clintons, so on and so forth. Is there something of a point, even if you say this is not disqualifying, did he go a little bit too far and should he at some point walk a little bit of this back? I must say I'm not I'm not their guy. I mean, I, to my mind, you know, there's a lot of unattractive uh, aspects of the of the human character. A lot of things that we uh, do, where if we could be like perfectly objective and totally unemotional, uh, we'd be unhappy with. But you know, I mean, not to go all uh, uh, college philosophy, right? But but. Uh, Aristotle tells us, uh, you know, you know, you, when when something is a, a part of our character and a part of our reality, we ask what it's for, right? We don't say that it's bad. And if if uh, if being furious is part of our character, um, we have that attribute because it, it's useful for something. And I think in this instance, it was called for. I mean, you got a guy who was called a serial rapist. Uh, some of the stuff that was put out about him, forget about the stuff that just came out in the in the Senate hearing, some of the stuff that was put out about him was just atrocious. And I thought that the moment, I frankly thought that after um, Dr. Ford testified and the prosecutor that the Republicans brought in to question her did not confront the incoherent aspects of her story, um, that he, I, I really thought he was not going to be confirmed. I, I thought that uh, she had come off well enough that it was pretty much over. That I, that I thought these wobbling senators would go the other way, and I thought his opening statement, which ran for almost an hour, got him back in the game. I mean, I know that uh, everybody's talking about Lindsey Graham's speech, and it was something of a, a barn burner for sure. But I think if, if Kavanaugh had not given the opening statement that he gave, um, we wouldn't even be talking about Lindsey Graham uh, because the moment called for what he provided, which was indignation and passion and uh, a, a marshalling of the facts that only somebody who is as good a lawyer as he is uh, would be capable of doing under those circumstances. So I don't I, I really didn't have a problem with it. Andy, I want to ask you a question about what what could come, what are the kinds of things that could come out of this investigation that would make you change your mind about whether Brett Kavanaugh should be confirmed? For example, if it's proven that he was not truthful about something, another network right now reporting that Brett Kavanaugh was trying to marshal friends and supporters of his to come out against the Ramirez allegations before the New Yorker story published, he testified before Congress that the first he heard of the allegations was after it published. So we'll see if that proves to be true. But are there things that could come out of the investigation that might, is there anything that might give you pause about Brett Kavanaugh? Uh, sure. I mean, if, he, if, it, if it emerged that he gave false testimony about something that was critically important, sure. And if it turned out that there was anything um, it, it, I think that if it turned out that there was anything to these allegations, it, at the moment, I think that they're, they seem to be disintegrating. But obviously, if there was something to them, uh, then he shouldn't be – he not only shouldn't be a, a, in the, uh, on the Supreme Court, he shouldn't be a federal judge. Uh, I don't expect that to happen, but I, you know, I, 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 I did this for a living for a long time, and – you know, what we always tell jurors, you know, the people who have to decide as opposed to, you know, people in the in the peanut gallery like me. <laughs> right. Um, what we tell jurors is that they should hold their tongue 
and not express opinions, even though there are many times during a trial when something will happen that you'll have a strong opinion about. We always encourage jurors not to express themselves until the end when they've heard all the arguments and, and gotten instructed by the court, because when you plant your feet, uh, just a, in a human way, it's very hard to walk it back when you see evidence that refutes what you thought was true. So I think, you know, for people who are have to decide this, um, if we're going to have this investigation, I mean, I wouldn't have had the investigation, but if you're going to have it, then you have to consider everything that comes in and weigh it and make a decision. Andy, you alluded just a moment ago to the fact that you were for a long time a federal prosecutor. And I referenced earlier in the show, and I have a piece up at townhall.com referencing this as well, the five-page memo put out by Rachel Mitchell, who is the sex crimes prosecutor uh, who was there for the, uh, for the hearings last week. She has gone through this evidence backwards and forwards, and she came out with, uh, in my view, a very compelling case about the weakness of the case against Judge Kavanaugh. Have you read the memo? Do you agree with her analysis? Um, and I'll leave it at that. I've read the memo. I agree with her analysis. But what really, I must say, annoys me about it, Guy, is that um, I think that America was riveted to this testimony, This what turned out to be a television event on, I guess it was Thursday now, right? Yes. Um, I think, you know, having just done this for a living, it seemed to me that she was conducting this hearing, which was much more like a very contentious hearing or a trial. She was conducting it as if she was taking a deposition. And it seemed to me in the moment that while the Democrats on the committee were showing that five minutes can be used in a very effective way, you know, you ask two or three pointed questions. Now, they had the advantage of uh, being sort of friendly questioners, so they were taking her uh, where, she, where they wanted her to go and where she was willing to go, and then making a few statements about the, uh, about the process, uh, which had the, uh, had the chairman of the committee back on his heels from time to time. So I think they demonstrated that in a, in a hearing of this type, even though a lot of people have criticized the format, a lot can be done in five minutes. Whereas I thought Ms. Mitchell, uh, for all her uh, being methodical and, and all that stuff, uh, she looked like she was collecting information with the, th the thought that at some other point uh, she would confront the witness, but just not today. And it seemed to me that today was the time. And right. that has consequences because people came away from it thinking she was credible. And I think you could say she was sincere and still maintain that her story doesn't make any sense, and that needed to be confronted. Andrew McCarthy, Fox News contributor, National Review, you can find him online, has decades of experience working in law enforcement issues. Thank you for joining the show tonight. I know we will be watching the next few days very closely to see what comes from this process. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great night.